Start off with uh, Scare Gowdy. Is this kind of picking up with what Brandon talked about last year? So, some really cool underwater applications uh, of Beaver Radio. Okay, can everybody hear me? Good? All right. So, as you uh, started, my name is Eric Alley. Um, I work with Dr. Ray Cook-Dower and Dr. Linda Moore and the Laser Magnetics and Advanced Technology Branch. Um, from that area down in the Trust River, she's just about an hour and a half uh, south of here, so not too long. Um, our branch focuses on, of course, lasers and magnetics, but um, what my colleagues and I study or what we focus on is the characterization of the underwater optical channel. We do this to enhance underwater optical communications and underwater optical communications. So today, I'd like to introduce the current state of our optical communication systems that we built and the progress we made towards localizing this and how it's offered by radio. So optical systems have several applications, and I have listed just a few of them on the slide here. Uh, oceanographers are often interested in having the bottom of the ocean or lakes or any other body of water. It's much like um, how graphic maps uh, can be interesting for uh, shipping lanes or just science in general. Oil and gas industry uh, would like to be able to monitor oil rigs or pipelines um, with high resolution. So uh, high resolution then. And what's important to us is, um, in the defense sector, is detection, um, high accuracy ranging, and high speed communications. So sonar has been around for a long time. And sonar can do all this stuff uh, to a certain degree. It can do imaging, it can do radiation, it can do generations. Um, but it has some downfalls. Uh, it's ranging, uh, it's accuracy, it's not as good as out most communications are slow and not dialed in. So we wish not to get rid of sonar. Sonar is going to be here today for a long time, but to complement sonar and build the capability gap um, topics. And that gap is the high speed communications and the high resolution in the world. Of course, with all these great things that Alpha is bringing to the table, there are also some complications. I want to a to way to understand how the ocean is sinking. If you're driving at night and it's clear out and you want to see farther, you turn on your high beams and you can see better. Um, same is for, same goes for clear um, open ocean water. Uh, in our case, we use lasers as our illumination source, so if we want to see farther or if it's better, we just turn up the laser power and it's great. But unfortunately, optics uh, or light is susceptible to particulates in the water. So, if you think of driving on a foggy night or a night with heavy rain, uh, you turn on your high beams, you see worse because all that light you just put out into the environment reflects off of the, um, the fog and right back into your eye. Uh, same thing happens with uh, imaging um, communications in current water. The more light you put in the water, the more clutter you create, and you just make it harder to solve. So what we're trying to study is how do we separate the object we're trying to image or detect um, from this clutter. So clutter suppression techniques that have been around for a long time, uh, for over half a century, radar has been using them to with great success. And we love to use these techniques. Uh, it's lazy and you don't want to bring them to you. Um, but radar doesn't penetrate water. It gets into a very quickly. But we know that light penetrates water. So what we do you combine the LIDAR and the radar by modulating the chemical of the radar, or using the chemical of the radar to modulate the intensity of the LIDAR uh, to create this hybrid LIDAR radar technology. So we combine the benefits of light, which is transmission through water, with the benefits of radar RF signal processing, uh, the short signal processing uh, that exists there, and where there's RF signal processing not far behind by the software. In addition to utilizing radar techniques, we also have to consider architecture to fully optimize the system. Um, again, thinking of automotive lights, uh, fog lights are special lights that help us see better in fog. And it's not that the light itself is special. What's special is that it's, a, it's at a different position 
uh, relative to the, the eye, or to the driver's eye, it's actually farther away from the eye. So the light that the fog light emits has less probability to scatter back into the eye of the, um, the driver. So we thought we could try and use this to um, help with our healing system in addition to the regular techniques. So in typical, one type of typical imager, the laser and receiver are on the same platform very close to each other. So it's the same problem as having headlights and fog. Uh, so if we use the fog light technique and we spread them apart, um, you get less scattering back into the receiver. But unfortunately, your platform size gets too, too big um, to be useful. It gets cumbersome and um, just isn't practical. So how can we, um, oh, going back, back. And in, in addition to this, if we want to put this on an airborne platform, the laser source has to propagate through the water surface. And in doing so, the refraction and um, bending of the light going through the surface causes distortions in the image. So how can we use these architecture exploits while not having all these downfalls? Seems too good to be true. But there is one way to at least achieve this partially. The box tag approach. What we do is we take the conventional imagers seen on the left-hand side we bring the part into two much smaller um, components, just the receiver and just the transmitter. Now we're able to optimize the distance between the transmitter and the target, which now allows us to reduce scattering because the light is propagated through less water. This increases um, the beam quality, which in turn increases <coughs> image quality. We're also able to maximize the distance that the receiver can stand off. And the good thing about this is that the transmitter um, is essentially um, dumb, or what we want to make it is a dumb transmitter. It has one mission, and if you lose it, it's okay. But the receiver is what's getting all the imagery back. That's where the sensitive, maybe classified information is. So if you can pull that away from the, um, the area that's dangerous that you're imaging, then that's, that's better. And we use this LiDAR uh, radar technology to modulate the intensity of the transmitter with an RF pair. And then we can use um, typical communication techniques to encode uh, synchronization and comms information on the transmitter. Because now, um, since the transmitter and receiver are on separate platforms, they need a way to talk to each other. Before they were on the same platform, they could just share links uh, very easily. Now, they do this through a wireless communication signal from the object of the light. And because these are now much smaller, I um, can imagine um, this is a much uh, more scalable system. You can have a lot of transmitters, each at their own frequency band, um, surveying an area, and one or multiple receivers sitting above the ocean surface, uh, just collecting and repairing multiple transmitters. Uh, so this um, supports a distributed sensing uh, architecture. And finally, uh, now, like I said um, before, with the conventional, if your source has to go through the surface, it gets distorted. The imagery, the resulting imagery gets distorted. But now, since they're, uh, the source and the receiver on separate platforms, we can keep the source underneath the, the surface, and therefore we're uh, unaffected by this uh, distortion on the, uh, the air sphere. So, as everyone knows, by now, SDRs are very flexible, which is great. Uh, we like them because uh, we can make great trade-offs um, in the transfer. We can trade off frame rate, resolution, slot, which is how wide we're scanning, and different modulation schemes. Uh, right now, we use FSK, but if we're in a situation where we need something more exotic, it's really easy to drop and block in the like radio and it's done. Um, there's no, no awkward change. So, this allows us to change parameters on the fly, which makes it a great multi-mission device, which is very attractive to the Navy. Um, because if you get out to the field and you discover that it's different than what you thought it was going to be, the water's dirtier, there's something else, you can just load a different mission on the spot. You don't have to go back home, get a different system, and come back down. On the receiver side, we like it because we can change things such as gain, gain one power gain, trade off uh, signal to noise versus resolution. So, it's really dirty and we can 
sacrificing resolution and then you're average some more to get more signal to noise. So I just showed you how this works, and you're probably wondering, you know, prove it. Uh, so we we took this uh, this target, this spatial resolution target, used to measure um, how well an imaging system can uh, detect different spatial resolutions. Um, so we took this out to the Chesapeake Bay on the scope, uh, owned by the University of Maryland, and we threw it off the end. And as everybody knows, well, at least the people that live around here, the Chesapeake Bay is extremely dirty. And I wouldn't suggest this, but if you jumped in there and you tried to open your eyes and look at your hand, you probably would be able to see it from your face. Uh, it's that dirty. Um, so here's a picture of us on the back of the boat. Um, that's Brandon cooking out, and he's standing by the transmitter. And it's connected to a rack that is also connected to the target. It looks like we're about to throw it off the back of the boat to start our test. So here are some results. Um, on the left is our test setup. We have the receiver above the water surface, um, about 2.3 meters, and then the receiver, in the, or, excuse me, the, the transmitter to the target will lower between 3.8 meters below the, the water surface. So first off, I um, just want to say we can actually see it, which is pretty amazing. Uh, we're very excited about it. Um, as you get deeper, you can see that the signal to noise lowers, and that's, that's expected because as you go deeper in the water, the more you put down to absorb, um, that can be overcome by putting more laser power into the water. Um, that's a separate um, difficulty that the scattering has talked about before. Um, but what's also amazing is that we don't see any distortions to the air sea interface. So because our source is below the water surface and doesn't have to propagate through it, um, we don't see any wind effects. So, we thought this was really cool, you know, it was really exciting, but it doesn't really represent what we want. Uh, the, the, sort, or, yeah, the source and the target are fixed with respect to each other. And we did this to simplify um, the test setup and to um, keep the number of changing variables to a minimum so we can see the effect of the, just the, the water on the system. But now what we want to do is really get the transmitter moving relative to the scene or the target. And um, also have multiple receivers above the water uh, receiving that imagery. And what better platform than an autonomous vehicle? So we're collaborating with the University of Maryland, um, the same people, or the same school that um, we did the, the boat cruise on, because uh, um, they own a, a real 600 AV. So this is a relatively large AV. Um, you want to be able to just pick it up and throw it into the, into the water. It's about the size of a person or bigger. Um, but because it's large, it's stable. And it's also very mature. It's been used for many applications that are commercial and military, uh, such as harbor security operations, mine countermeasures, uh, even debris field mapping and search and salvage, such as I think they were using these to look for those uh, Malaysian airplanes at the bottom of the ocean. So it's very mature, and we thought this was the perfect first step to test our system. So let's get into some hardware. So the transmitter involves um, one controller that runs through the radio. Um, it controls two M210s. One has a LFTX dollar board that sends um, baseband signals to control the Dallas scanner, which is an XY scanner. Um, the uh, second M210 has a WDX, and that controls the communications and, um, and the RF side of things. That goes to an electro optic uh, amplitude modulator, which is um, just fancy for we're changing the brightness of the light of the laser relative to the RF signal. So if the RF signal goes up, the light goes up. If it goes down, the light goes down. So that's how we do the hybrid light operator. And then we can encode on top of that. Using the new radio uh, data, uh, which we do with the uh, scan. And on the right is a picture on the top. That's all the um, components uh, put into a compact um, uh, form factor that would fit inside the remus. And at the bottom is the actual water tube that we'll use to uh, seal that. Uh, the software in the transmitter, uh, I said it's run, uh, it's run by the radio. Uh, the 
PM210, um, the WBX, the Dr. K comms, it has a 70 megahertz carrier and about 250 kilobits per second data rate, which is modest for um, what we claim for high speed comms, but uh, uh, theoretically we can get up to multiple megabits per second rate with the 70 uh, got there yet. And the second M210 with the LTX uh, that drives the Galvo, that's uh, that scans in a zigzag fashion, or it sends out signals in like a um, a triangle, triangle wave at 500 meters per second, uh, 40 degree scan at one meter from the target, and this gives these combination of all this gives a sub millimeter spatial resolution, which is amazing uh, compared to other systems such as sonar. Um, and the reason why we're Sonar does have some great imaging capabilities, but the reason, one reason why we're pushing for this is that some missions require a true optical ID, and you just can't get that with sonar um, by definition. Uh, so it's a little bit um, it's more of a doctrine thing, um, but that's one reason we're pushing for this. Uh, so I show uh, an example of a raster scan underneath um, the text there, and also an example of the protocol we use to communicate with the receiver. So the transmitter, uh, well you can see the blue line, the solid blue line is the carrier magnitude. And the little blocks of gray are the communication blocks. So we use a frame-based uh, protocol. We have a start frame which tells the receiver, uh, get ready, uh, we're going to scan a, uh, a target soon. Then we send a block of comms, which is optional, but we can send additional information like how fast we're going to scan, how wide we're going to scan, uh, other relevant information like GPS data, where the transmitter is, you know, or anything relevant uh, to the scan. And then we start scanning. And at the beginning of each line of the scan, we send a pseudo rate of sequence um, for the receiver to lock onto that allows them to slice the image um, and put it back together uh, at the other end. And at the, finally, at the end, as, um, as uh, our redundancy, we have an end of frame to tell the receiver, all right, stop taking, uh, taking data, get ready for the next turn. So here's the flow graph. Um, it's probably not very legible, but on the top is all the variables. Um, the FSK communications is in green, and the scanner control is in red. Um, it's not much going on there, but I just wanted to show it. On the other end, the, uh, the receiver, we have two of them, and they're, they're identical. Uh, they have collection options in the front, and we do that to open up the field of view and the aperture of the system and collect as much light as possible. And it focuses it down into an interference filter, which is tuned to the same wavelength of the light that we're using. And we do that because um, we only want to let the light that we want through. Um, so we don't ruin the uh, dynamic range of our sensor with uh, sunlight or any other ambient uh, light. <coughs> So that light is then converted into an electrical signal by a photomultiplier tube. This photomultiplier tube uh, then sends its signal into the, into each receiver has its own N210 for the WBX. And currently we use LabVIEW to interface with the N210s, um, which might be like a sin to you guys. But uh, in the receiver, we do this because we started with LabVIEW before getting radio, and we were familiar with um, how it works. So, we just continue with that and figure in the next iteration we'll try more to get um, in radio. And actually, I just found out that there's a time raster sync now that we weren't aware of. And that was the big hurdle that we had uh, back when we developed this. We didn't have the time raster sync that we needed to get real time uh, imagery. So now there is one, I'm going to tell you that. So before integrating this into the Remus, uh, we are going to plan on doing extensive lab testing. We have a large water tank, it's about 7.2 meters uh, wide and 5 meters deep. Um, and we plan on putting a translation stage on top of it to simulate the movement of an autonomous vehicle. Um, and we use the translation stage because it provides a very stable test bed uh, to allow for movement, but without having to worry about vehicle dynamics. So we can simulate the movement in a very predictable fashion, and then, um, and then we have the receivers above the water receiving the imagery. And again, we have the same target. Uh, we use this resolution target uh, extensively in our tests. So in the future, um, we plan on, like I said, doing tank testing, um, but we also make a multi-receiver module. Right now, 
now actually we have two in the next that's maybe up to seven uh, to increase our coverage. So if we go out to the, uh, the bay, um, we don't have to we don't have to keep moving the receiver. We can cover a much larger area. And uh, a cool project that actually happened this summer just uh, just ended. Actually, we had an intern working for us from the University of Maryland. We modified an open RMP, which is a, uh, a cheap open source underwater vehicle. It's less than a thousand dollars for um, for ocean exploration, which is which is great. And what he did is he packed it into a very small container, much smaller than the one that I showed you, that big black one. So um, he put a, a laser, uh, a MEM scanner, and other control electronics, and it all is based off the of open RMP um, software. So it's still open source and, um, and it's still cheap. So the great thing about this is that um, in the distributed sensing sense that I mentioned earlier, you could put a swarm of these out to survey an area. And uh, they, like I said, they're dumb, they have a pre-programmed mission, and they go survey an area. And if the area turns out to be dangerous or somewhere you're not supposed to be, and you lose some of those, it's no big deal. You just make some more, and then you send some more out. So, uh, there's a real big push to make make this really small, really cheap for applications just like that. So, to conclude, uh, we're putting things in motion. Um, we're trying to make our system more uh, applicable to real life scenarios. We're making it uh, mobile relative to the, the scene it's in. Um, we need SDRs at the backbone of our system, um, even though uh, we don't use complete new radio control. We use some lacking too. And to my knowledge, for the first had a user piece underwater. Um, so this, we see this as a necessary step, both these things, uh, implementing this, this technology on mobile autonomous vehicles with uh, distributed sensing architectures. Thank you. Thank you.